Today's conversation is with Professor John Evans. John is a plant physiologist who leads the Evans Group at the Australian National University. His research focuses on topics like photosynthesis and the effect of climate change on plants. John provided a wide range of insights throughout the conversation, like the applicable advice for us undergraduates to attend our lectures, as well as providing insights on topics previously discussed, like competition and science. We enjoyed this conversation, and we hope you do too. Here is our conversation with John Evans. So we'd like you just to tell us about yourself. You know, what have you enjoyed about being a scientist? Uh, what are some interesting projects that you've worked on? Right, well, um, so I'm a plant physiologist. I study mainly photosynthesis, uh, particularly the CO2 diffusion into chloroplasts. So uh, photosynthesis, of course, um, takes sunlight and CO2 from the atmosphere to uh, liberate oxygen from water and produce the food that's basically the basis of all, all oxygenic biology on the planet, which is the vast majority of, of life. Um, of course, during my career, there's been amazing advances, particularly in molecular biology. I'm not a molecular biologist, but I've collaborated with colleagues who are experts in that field. Um, and that's enabled uh, some very elegant experimental um, work, which as a physiologist, you can interpret um, the phenotype of plants and how that impacts uh, the plant performance. And of course, the dream is to apply that sort of knowledge to improve crop productivity because food security is going to be a major challenge for us uh, in the face of climate change, uh, continued growth in human population and uh, the social inequity um, around the globe. So uh, towards the end of my career, it was, was wonderful to bring together multiple aspects of the research that I'd done, which was quite um, not applied earlier on in my career um, to bring it all together to focus on um, trying to, to improve crop productivity. And that was part of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis that, was, um, that I was based at ANU in the Research School of Biology. Uh, yeah, so we read that. So you run your own group, uh, your research group. So wondering what's involved in running that and how does one get to the position to be able to run your own group as well as like what work, uh, what research you're working on right now? Yes, hang on, I'll just shut the door. <clears throat> sure. So um, I guess during my career, I was really fortunate in um, obtaining uh, both grant funding and, and uh, also salary money that largely enabled me to pretty much work on topics of my choice. Uh, so I was able to main a, a sort of a fairly common thread and focus through my career. And that's really uh, quite unusual, I think, these days. So new, new graduates entering into science um, basically have to follow the money. So typically, uh, you would do an undergraduate degree with honours, um, maybe go on to a PhD, and then enter a postdoctoral period. And typically, that's financed by uh, more senior researchers who've applied for, uh, for grants. And so you would be under contract to, to do a particular type of research that was defined by your supervisor. So it's actually quite difficult to develop your independence, but also keep a, a common focus on your research because the postdoctoral positions are generally uh, one or two years or maybe a little bit longer. So you hop between projects um, and it may be some time before you uh, get the chance to actually get your own uh, funding to run your own research program. So my career was, is probably quite unusual in that respect. Um, that's not to say the current system, um, you know, has it, it, it is what it is, and you, you basically have to learn to, to, to work within that. And uh, it sort of depends whether you're a broad um, generalist or a specialist in terms of your uh, academic interests, because uh, uh, if you're a specialist, of course, maintaining a focus or a particular technique of your expertise is is key, whereas if you're a generalist, you can adapt to new projects and broaden your arsenal of skills and apply your, your broader skill set uh, to tackle new projects and bring in interdisciplinarity, which can be um, a real game changer. That's right. And 
sort of going through the introduction phase, um, if you don't mind, tell us a bit about ANU as an institution. Obviously, it's a highly respected institution, not just in Australia, but in the world. And how is it run? And what is it that makes it a top Australian universe, university, maybe? And why and when should maybe a student in their undergraduate or postgrads um, go there? Well, ANU is unique in the Australian university system uh, because when it was established, it was basically um, uh, joining a, a research institute and an undergraduate um, teaching uh, uh, university. So it has always had a, a huge amount of funding come in uh, to support just research only. So that used to be called the Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, and that was a block grant from the federal government. So the ACT, Australian Capital Territory, of course, is a small um, territory with not a lot of finance compared to uh, some of the states. So in contrast to the big uh, other group of seven universities in Melbourne or Brisbane or Sydney, uh, where the state governments can, can provide lots of additional funds, the Australian National University, had, it was very much reliant on federal government funding and uh, over time that that uh, funding situation has evolved um, eventually and you re was allowed to join into the australian research council uh, grants uh, competitive grants process um, and uh, we did very well in that because of course we had a long track record of research uh, the australian national university is a small university in terms of the undergraduate population uh, it has a fantastic campus, a uh, very spacious, um, beautiful um, location. Um, it's a small city, so um, there's pluses and minuses associated with that, depending on whether you're a large city person or you like, um, you like uh, a smaller, smaller city. Uh, more recently, the Vice Chancellor has made um, massive efforts to try and house all students on campus, at least for their first year. Um, obviously, COVID has, has caused a few hurdles in that respect, but initially students uh, can expect to um, find accommodation on the campus and subsequently they, they may wish to move out to private accommodation. So ANU offers um, a, a small cohort of undergraduate students, um, but a very research intensive um, academic staff. So the teaching loads generally uh, are quite low on the staff which means they they have very active research pro projects and a lot of the curriculum um, offers courses which can be quite research intensive so you may actually work in somebody's lab for a semester to do a project um, and actually really get to see uh, what scientific experimentation and scientific work really is about and then if you like that sort of thing or not so um, I, I went to ANU um, as an undergraduate and, and a postgraduate and then spent most of my career working there apart from uh, postdoctoral periods in the UK and also at CSIRO. Right. So if you don't mind, could you tell us a bit about that undergraduate experience at ANU and also in general, any advice for undergraduate students? Uh, so, sorry, you wanted to ask me about my undergraduate um, time? Perhaps, yes. And maybe starting well, from one. that. Yeah. Yeah. So my undergrad undergraduate time, of course, was quite a while ago. Um, and in those days, um, you basically uh, had lots of one hour lectures and lots of practical classes. So I did a science degree with honours. And I think I would have had two or three afternoons a week doing three hour laboratory practicals um, with a report that had to be written up after each one of those. So I think I was really fortunate uh, when I did my degree to actually be able to spend so much time doing practical work um, with a, your cohort of students, um, you know, socialising and, and um, also getting a lot of feedback in the writing of the reports um, and getting the practical experience, hands-on experience. And I think uh, in the current uh, environment, there is far fewer opportunities to do experimental work in a, in a laboratory practical system. Uh, a lot of the practical classes now are sort of theoretical or, or online rather than hands-on. And that partly reflects the fact that a lot of the students don't actually want to go on to research or don't need those sort of physical skills. But uh, to me, the, the practical classes were a fantastic opportunity to socialise, 
but also to, to learn skills. Uh, and of course, these days, um, I, I have been lecturing and it's it's noticeable how a one hour lecture format has 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 waned in terms of popularity for students. I think students find it quite difficult to focus attention for one hour period as um, through a lecture. And during COVID, we, we switched to do, delivering online uh, lectures, which I gave live, but they're also recorded. So a lot of students could choose to watch them subsequently and either watch them at two or four times real speed or slow them down or repeat or just watch them in chunks. And some of the student feedback was, why couldn't they be delivered in 15 minute bursts? Well, um, I mean, you can watch a lecture and turn it off after 15 minutes and do it in 15 minutes bursts, but it's obviously a, um, some of the, the new uh, lecturers that have come on board are adopting different formats for, for content delivery. So I think the, you will see uh, quite a different sort of teaching uh, experience than, than what I had as an undergraduate. And for some students, that's uh, a real positive. I think the thing that you risk losing though is the, the socializing with your cohort, because to me, that was one of the really important things about going to university was meeting your friends and, and arguing, discussing, and, and just having a great time, you know, um, forming lifelong friendships. Right, so we are moving to our undergraduate years and from your experiences, what advice would you give to an undergraduate science student? Yes, yeah, so that was one of the questions you prompted me with. So I was thinking yeah. about that. And I guess, um, I guess everyone learns in a different way. And for me, I really got a lot out of attending lectures and listening intently to the lecture deliver it rather than reading textbooks or, or independently trying to obtain the information. But I realised that that doesn't suit everybody's style of learning. But for me, um, key advice would be attending lectures because um, that allows you to ask questions of the lecturer. It's often really hard to think of a question on the spur of the moment. But like if you've been presented with information you don't understand, uh, stop the lecturer, ask a question because you, many of your other students uh, may be too frightened to speak um, and probably have the same question. And it's really good for the lecturer to get the feedback that, oh, okay, that concept didn't get across. We need to spend more time uh, going around it or explaining it or, or introducing some other sort of information. So attend lectures and, and speak up, ask questions. Uh, in some classes, of course, there'll be preparatory material that you're given in advance. And uh, sometimes that seems overwhelming, a lot of reading involved, but the more you put into that preparation, the more you'll actually get out of the session that follows. So if you're going to do a practical class, read the lab notes before you get to the practical class, understand what the what the idea of the experiment is so you can plan and, and, and be efficient in your time in the laboratory. Um, and similarly with assessment items, um, seek feedback. So anything you, you write, um, one of the best ways of learning how to improve your writing is to, is to get feedback. And they, that doesn't have to be from the lecturers or tutors. Uh, it can be from your fellow students um, because when you, it's a lifelong skill, uh, we all have different abilities uh, in, in writing. And as a writer, what you're trying to do is have a reader excited about what you're, you're writing and understand what you're writing. And while you may think you've written it incredibly clearly, um, if a reader struggles with anything, um, then that's a really good thing for you to take note and try and work out, well, how can I make it easier on the reader? So seek feedback. And then the other thing I think is um, socialize. So really um, take the opportunity to, to um, make friends with your cohort, uh, join clubs or do sport um, because that side of university is is tremendously important for your mental well-being um, and as a balance of foil you can't just spend your whole life studying um, and having uh, a balanced lifestyle uh, throughout your life is, is really important and having a friendship circle uh, is really important so i feel for the students who during COVID have been in lockdown and haven't been able to meet with fellow students i mean you can do it on facebook or other social media, but that's really not the same as uh, physically interacting. 
Um, so socializing and having a healthy healthy lifestyle is really important to keep right. keep you going the longer term. Hmm. Right. And sort of as you mentioned, uh, being able to receive feedback and use it is a skill, and it's it's especially a useful skill in science. And sort of building on that. In your words, what do you think are some quintessential skills that a scientist has and should have, maybe? And what what attributes and qualities does a scientist encompass to you? Can, that uh, can be a bit of a grandiose question. Yeah. So, so I guess um, we would start with curiosity. I mean, basically, you have have this drive to ask questions and find well, you know, find out something new that hasn't been um, hasn't been described previously or has been lost in the literature and then remains to be rediscovered, as is often the case. I think a quality of perseverance. So most of the time you get a negative result or there's a lot of repetition or things go wrong and and persevering and trying and trying, the harder it is to crack often, the more the reward is when you actually break through. Um, having just talked a little bit about getting feedback. Um, most of the feedback you get will be criticism. So learning to take criticism and actually deal with it positively. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're writing a manuscript, there is never a final draft. Someone will always criticize it. And if you have a perfect version in someone's mind and you show it to someone else, there's gonna be always suggestions. And then when you submit it, the reviewers have further criticisms. So being able to deal with um, criticism um, the, the positive um, feedback is, is, is much less frequent. So I guess most people who are, who are scientists are basically driven by their curiosity and the perseverance to actually crack that nut at the end of it. And, and the reward that comes from doing that is, is fantastic. And discovering new things, like you become your own master of, of the work. You, you've set the question, you've set how you're going to do it. Uh, you, you can collect the data and analyze it. Um, so there's a lot of um, personal motivation and personal reward in doing that, or as part of a team. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do you think one can improve their the, such skills? Well, one of the things is being open to, to learning new techniques. So uh, technology is always advancing and um, being open to listening to, to a broad range of, of information. So I was lucky in my uh, undergraduate, postgraduate time to have um, a huge range of seminars that were, that, that were available. And I think these days, uh, so many more now are going online that it's possible to listen to, to lectures from, from all over the place, uh, all pre-recorded material on the internet. Um, and often it's lectures given in, in other fields can be really stimulating and open your eyes to something that you might be able to apply in your own um, area of interest. So learning a broad range of skills. And um, as I said earlier, whether you're a master, a generalist or a specialist, uh, you may have a, a broad arsenal of skills or you may wish to really master one particular one. So they are different strategies and you can't really do both. Uh, and it really comes down to your personality and, and what you find interesting as to which of those types of person you are. So um, always being open to new techniques, um, seeking advice from colleagues. Usually you'll find people are really helpful if you approach them and say, look, I've got this problem, or I'd like to learn that. Um, they're only too happy to, to share and to help and maybe, maybe even become involved in, in your question. So don't be afraid to seek out help um, and collaborate with people because then you enlarge your, your network um, professionally. Cool. Uh, so the next question is, how do you think someone can determine if they should stay in research science? Or say, if you've seen people leave science over the years, it's like, what do you think were some of the common reasons for it? Yeah, so I think um, depending on, on, on your ultimate uh, um, objective, let's say uh, you were interested in a research career. So you would do, as I said, your honors degree, um, PhD, get a postdoc. They're, that's generally pretty straightforward, getting postdoctoral fellowships, because there's, there's quite a lot of them around. Um, 
And if you're prepared to move uh, around the country or internationally, it's a fantastic time of your life to be to be um, to be traveling and working abroad. Uh, so the tricky situation comes a little bit after that, and probably I'm not sure what the current statistics are, but it may be only one in ten uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows will actually end up uh, with a career in research uh, academia. So nine out of ten people are going to move into other other professions, other jobs. That's not to say they've failed, uh, because all of those other options are often very rewarding. But for some people who really cherish the um, ideal of becoming a research scientist, they often feel, uh, you know, that they have failed and they didn't get there. So we we do spend a lot of time. Um, actually off opening people's eyes to the, the broad range of opportunities that, that academics have um, once they, they've become a postdoc. And, um, you know, the, the majority of people will find uh, work in slightly different areas. So you might find work in, um, for example, in agriculture, there can be consulting companies, there can be, uh, for example, the Grains Research and Development Corporation, which um, uh, decides on there's a grower funded levy on grains which is then reinvested for for research to benefit farmers so there's that grant opportunity there's plenty of jobs in the public service for uh, science graduates because as a graduate you'll have a lot of skills that are very very valuable you know how to read literature write look quantitatively at data present um, either talks or, or written material write reports so there's a lot of skills that you gain, uh, which which are, um, are generally applicable. And uh, I've had PhD students, you know, move um, through uh, into very high ranking public service positions. Um, and I've had um, others who've done well in academia. So uh, a lot of it is chance as to when opportunities come up and, and whether you're available to take them. Um, and so it's quite difficult to predict. And obviously, the more flexible you are, um, the easier it is to get positions, but you also have to persevere. You have to apply um, and be open to things to, to get the offers. Right. And sort of about that, what is your insight about non-academic non roles, so maybe industry in, in, in detail, if you've had the experience or if you've heard about it? Sorry, in the industry? Yes. Employment so market. Sciences in, in this industry. Yes. Uh, so, um, if we think about uh, agriculture in particular, I guess which is where most of my experience is, there's a tremendous demand for science graduates, people with expertise. Um, and if you think about uh, all of the different fields that where expertise is needed in farming, um, you think about disease resistance. So, people who who studied pests and diseases, um, that's that's never going to go away. We always need to have people who are skilled in in, in that sort of area. Uh, in terms of plant breeding, uh, varieties need to be produced continually because they're always breaking down um, because of pests and diseases, but for also for for other reasons. So there, there is a tremendous um, massive effort continually breeding new varieties uh, to maintain production for farmers. Less so introducing new new crops, um, although that's a possibility. Most work is actually on existing crops and trying to overcome issues that arise. So that, that encompasses a huge range of skills. Um, so depending on what skill set you have, you know, there's many different niches in that sort of environment uh, for employment. And they don't have to be um, well, like a broad range of types of employers from government through to industry to the farming groups. Um, right. Oh, you, you mentioned right at the start when we asked about uh, your career experiences that your earlier research wasn't as applied, whereas your, uh, your research later on was applied. So how, how, do, how are you able to get that research applied? I suppose, and also in general, how does uh, research in academia Get applied to various aspects like of society yes so these days um, for example with the australian research council grants 
Uh, there's the national interest test. So most people have to try and find one of the topics that the, the federal government deems to be important and try and spin a little blurb as part of their grant application to, as to why this research is should be being funded by the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the work that I did, I was, I guess I've just been interested in photosynthesis, um, just fundamentally. And initially the work I did was on one of the enzymes associated with photosynthesis, um, just from curiosity. And I've also been interested in just how leaves work um, from, a, from their physiology. And then uh, when the Center of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis came about, basically the concept of that center was how can we apply our knowledge and understanding of photosynthesis to try and improve crop productivity? So all of the little components that I'd been working on, which by themselves were not necessarily targeted towards um, a, a crop improvement outcome, could be focused in on different um, topics within the centre and contribute to, to that effort. Uh, Previously, I'd also spent a lot of time researching uh, plant responses to rising atmospheric CO2 for global change. Uh, not so much the impact of climate, but just the direct effect of atmospheric CO2 on plants. And that was, um, and still is, a hugely political area. Uh, it's exceedingly disappointing to me that there has been so little progress um, worldwide on reaching agreement that, that this is a disaster of our own making and we need to act collectively to, to address it. Um, so uh, the work that I did that was, was you know, designed to try and think about areas like that. But um, I, in the end, I, I got out of that field just because uh, it was so politically um, difficult. Right. Um, I suppose that's sort of segue into our next question. So we've touched on this briefly, but we're curious about what your motivations for being a scientist are and what they were earlier in the career and suppose what they are now. Hmm. Um, so my father was a, a crop physiologist and he was recruited to Canberra to build what's called the Vitatron in those days. Um, it's now been renamed um, a different name, but, but anyway, it's basically a set of glass houses and controlled environment cabinets for growing plants under a range of conditions. Um, and it was funded um, by the Menzies government at the same time that Parks Radio Telescope was, was, um, was built. Uh, and both of those investments by the government represented massive amounts of money, public money, uh, into science. Um, of, of a, the order that's basically not seen these days. And so as a kid, I used to be taken into the, the Phytotron on the weekends and wander around, used to have to put on this white zoot suit and comb your hair with a sort of sterilized comb and put on, on sandals, and then walk through this big building and look at all these wonderful plants growing under different uh, climates. So there was a huge diversity of plants there. Um, so I've, I've been interested in plants um, I guess since a kid and then in, in uh, university I was interested in doing science and I did botany as one of my units in first year so I did botany, chemistry, physics and maths um, and in those days the zoology was a separate stream and because I hadn't done zoology basically I was locked out of zoology subsequently so I just kept on doing um, botany, plant, plant research um, and I've always liked working on plants. So how did it work out? Well, I guess um, I've been really fortunate in being able to actually take my whole career through studying plants and I'm still fascinated by plants. And um, it's very exciting to, to think about challenges that still exist. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, so I suppose you had your sort of specialization sort of from like the onset but how do you think others can try to pick something that they specialize in? Maybe not as early, maybe like while they're doing their PhD or afterwards. What factors do you think they should consider? Well, I think part of it is is uh, getting inspired by people. You may have come, you may come across a, a you know a lecturer or a, a scientist who who 
this work you admire. So as an undergraduate, you may get the opportunity to work in somebody's lab and do uh, join in part of their research um, to do to, to contribute. And I would advise that you shop around, like, you know, try different different labs because you get a different experience at every lab you work in on how the, how it works socially, um, the, the techniques that are used, the approaches that are used. And, and hopefully uh, you will also get a feeling for, hey, I really like this sort of work. Um, it suits, suits me and, and I, I would like to, to, to take this on. Alternatively, you might just see an advertisement for a, um, a PhD project or something which is on such and such a topic and you think, oh, that's really cool. I'd like to learn about that. And you don't necessarily have to have any of the prior knowledge or skills to start a project like that. We all start with, you know, some some skill set, but like all of all throughout your career, you're going to be learning new things all the time and not, not be afraid to actually pick up new techniques. So have, coming across opportunities uh, and then that really informs what sort of things you, you enjoy doing. Are you better at doing this than that? Or what sort of level do you like working at? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, this was taking it back to motivations. What do you think might be some common motivations of scientists in general? Like, what have you seen? Uh, well, I think curiosity um, is certainly needs to be there. Mm -hmm. um, a motivation, I guess, are you trying to save the world or do do something? Um, I guess you're trying to discover new things, understand how something works. Um, and then often with your expertise, you may be able to apply that into something completely different. So I know colleagues in, in the plant sciences division at ANU, uh, when COVID came along, uh, you know, they're expert in, in sequencing and uh, phylogenetic analysis, so the history of how, how organisms evolve. So they applied that to COVID. Um, they developed some, some clever techniques to sequence the virus and work out, well, you know, how is it evolving? Where did it come from? Um, where are the mutations? So being able to be um, open to taking your skill set and applying it into a new environment is, um, I think, uh, can be really good. And other people basically keep their blinkers on and say, no, I'm just interested in solving malaria and I'm going to spend my whole career um, doing that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that's actually really good because the uh, next question is, uh, yeah, I'm curious about how scientists categorize the importance of problems. Because I'm, I don't know if this exists, but like, I imagine that there might be like some sort of hierarchy of problems where you know, some may consider these problems to be more important than others. Like, first of all, yeah. does that exist? And how do you come about deciding? Which yeah, that, that's, that's actually a good, good question because, uh, of course, uh, you do make choices as to what, what, you, what you work on and what questions you ask. Mm -hmm. uh, part of those decisions are determined by the funding, like did you succeed in getting a grant to work on it? Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that was the most appropriate way to spend your effort, uh, unfortunately, because... Um, Often the system is interested in one sort of short-term answer, whereas the bigger pictures um, may not get fundable, or you're maybe you're ahead of the curve. Um, looking backwards, of course, it's always easier than at the time when you're trying to put up a proposal. Mm -hmm. And looking backwards, you can say, ah, you know, why did I go down that route? Why have I spent so much time doing that? What about if I'd done something different? Would it would it have been a better outcome? Well. Um, you know, not much of us have the opportunity to do it again. So, so that sort of doesn't necessarily help you. Generally, you at a at a, um, at a moment when you're trying to either seek a job or or apply for a grant, you need to be passionate about it. You need to you need to be able to sell the idea to whoever's either awarding the job or awarding the grant. And if you're not personally convinced and, and coherent in what you're clear in what you're trying to achieve, uh, it's not going to happen. So you may make repeated attempts to do something. And then if it, if it doesn't get up, well, you've got to come up with some other ideas. So part of it is, is responding to um, success in terms of either getting a job or getting, getting a grant funded. 
But that doesn't mean the ones that didn't get funded weren't good ideas or worthy of pursuit. And so that's, I guess, when you're looking back, would say, well, you know, if I'd gone down that route, um, you know, things could have been different. But sometimes it's a matter of timing. You know, the field hasn't developed or the technology doesn't exist that allows you to, to do that question at that time. And so maybe you can come back to it in 10 years' time when, when it becomes possible. Mm -hmm. And so that, that works at, at the individual level. And I'm curious, is there some sort of um, like collective decision about the problems that are worth spending more time in, like amongst, say, an entire field, or maybe, uh, I mean, the way this is described, it seems like well, the money is very important. Maybe the people who are giving out the money, like what, how do they consider what is worth spending more time on? Yeah, so I guess as a student, you have the opportunity to choose which university you go to, or as, as you move through university, you can undertake projects in other places. So, for example, ANU offers summer research scholarships, which encourages students to come from other universities over the summer break um, to do a research project in a, in a lab. Um, hopefully, then persuade you to either come to honours or do a PhD subsequently. Um, so these are wonderful opportunities for students to, to experience a different university um, and move around. There's a lot of uh, a lot of the time students know their lecturers and researchers, so tend to stay on in the same university. This is particularly so in Australia, whereas overseas, uh, it's much more encouraged to move around a lot. So experience other laboratories, other universities, which all enrich your your understanding of what's possible and how to do things. Sure. Um, and in general, what do you think might be some of the unpleasant aspects of being a scientist? <laughs> well, I guess one of the big ones is the lack of tenure. So it takes a long yeah. time, short term contracts moving around. Um, that's not only for the academics, but also for professional staff. So uh, some people can enjoy that, but at some point, most people find that's far too stressful and they have financial commitments, family commitments, which means, look, I really need a job with some security. So that I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing um, academics, researchers, um, is it's a long road before you can get um, job security. Um, if you're wanting to stay in research, I think if you, so a lot of people it's that which drives them to an alternative path um, going into industry or, or government jobs because generally they have more security or a higher pay as the as the inducement for a shorter contract. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the main challenge. Um, yeah. Uh, what about something like competition? <laughs> you know that we know it's a very competitive so how, how does that take effect on individuals yeah so there's there, that's interesting so you can have competition within the within the group you're in you mm -hmm. may be working on similar stuff and competing for resources or something um the competition may be with another academic group somewhere else either another university or internationally and then it sort of becomes like a race. Well, who's going to solve the problem, get the work published first? And then is it because you're part of a big team, you're going to have more success or less success? Or are you just more creative? You have a more creative mind or access to specific equipment that gives you an edge. Um, so competition, it's interesting. Often the biggest controversies arise where there's a lack of understanding. And so you'll set up different camps that have different ideas about what's going on and both are trying to prove their idea. And if this controversy persists, often it's because neither camp's right and often it's a combination of both. And so it's until the understanding has reached the point where actually this is the model and we've all been operating with incomplete knowledge, incomplete information to actually understand what goes on. So sometimes the controversy ultimately ends up a very beneficial outcome where, where something new happens and it resolves the, the, um, the division. Uh, is the competition, can the competition be toxic or bad? Well, sometimes fields get very, very um, combative and the publication system can be sort of skewed or who gets invited to speak at conferences uh, can become 
um, biased by particular camps or other. Um, and it differs with fields. So when I was uh, early in my postdoctoral career, I worked on the light reactions of photosynthesis and in international meetings, any session associated with that, there was always vociferous debate and very emotional people in the audience attacking one another and, and throwing up different ideas. Whereas in the dark reactions of photosynthesis, people were much more laid back and accepting and, and positive. So, it, 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 and that was one of the reasons why I, I said, look, there's light reactions, there's too combative. I don't enjoy this sort of um, environment. I'm going to move more into, into this area, which I think I can see, you know, the, the co-water people are more agreeable. So that sometimes that may, may um, persuade you to change direction slightly. <clears throat> Sure. But sometimes the competition is good. It spurs you to try harder. And, you know, when you when you get knocked back because a competitor says, well, that's not right, and you think you're right, but you may have overlooked something or, or you know, you actually haven't done the experiment in quite the way you thought you had or there's an alternative interpretation. So that's what science is about, is actually putting something out there, having it knocked down, rebuilding it and, and, and amplifying it to, to deepen the understanding. Sure. Mm -hmm. So throughout your talks, I sort of developed two personal questions that I'd like to ask you, if that's all right. And I'll start with the first one. You mentioned climate change, and uh, obviously you said you've, you've given your research background, you have some uh, specialized uh, facts and opinions in that subject area. What insight could you provide us uh, about the problem? And specifically, how can young scientists maybe get involved with the problem? solving the problem actually yes yeah, so i would I, I lectured on climate change in particular its impact on on plants and um i always encouraged my students to go and participate in the protests that were for climate action uh, because i think um especially um with oh god i've forgotten the um the swedish girls um greta yeah. thunberg yes Gre uh, greta thunberg um i mean she catalyzed this, this movement among youth where it gave them hope to say, look, you can make a difference and your voice can be heard. Um, but of course, it's still frustrating that things don't happen. Uh, so this is a, an absolutely important area for, for you to remain active and aware that uh, we need to change. And things are changing. I mean, there's been fantastic development of renewable photovoltaics, for example, you know, electricity generation um, with photovoltaics is, is transformational. Um, the trouble is for countries like Australia, where we have so much of our wealth built on the coal industry, there's a, an enormous embedded inertia and wealth and, and income associated with the, the extraction of coal, selling of coal and keeping coal king. Um, and, or the gas, or, or gas, natural gas. Um, so that's a, a, an incredibly difficult rock to to roll and move into an, an alternative path. But I think the success of wind and solar power uh, gives a lot of hope for for youth to to see that there is a, an alternative future. The fact that um, a petrol car is possibly you know going to go out 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 the window within decades or, or soon because electric vehicles can supply that same um, job uh, is also very encouraging so but the problem is climate change is not just our co2 emissions um, it has huge impacts uh, throughout society you know our consumer consumer des desires and demands when you think of uh, Australians and Americans and Europeans, our consumption relative to the vast majority of people in the world, um, I think we also need to be very cognizant of, of our own behaviours uh, and how we as a consumer impact the whole supply chain that drives this economy. So as a consumer, you can be active in well, what do I buy? Uh, who do I buy it? How do I buy it? How long do I keep it? What do I do with it? Is it recyclable? Where do I put pressure on manufacturers if, if something breaks down or um, comes in ridiculous amount of packaging? And I think certainly governments can play a big role in this. For example, in Germany, uh, the packaging has been substantially reduced on many things because 
there's been a recognition that this is just not sustainable. So there's huge progress that can be made and needs to be made on all sorts of levels, um, which is positive. Um, but over overhanging all of this, of course, is the imperative for speed. Like we don't have time to just muck around. We've wasted decades uh, of just prevaricating because the established lobby for fossil fuel, and I benefit, you know, I drive a car, um, but I mean, actually I've spent most of my career commuting to work on a bicycle. So I'm very fortunate and I've always lived close to or reasonably close to where I work. But I drive a car to go shopping or go on holidays. I've spent a lot of time in aeroplanes, traveling to international destinations. So your personal choices do have an impact. Um, and that's something that we all need to be mindful of. Right. Yeah. And, and the second question, which goes all the way back to one of the first questions, was about um, how students are sometimes shy in lectures and they're shy mm -hmm. of asking questions. Uh, firstly, I want to know why do you think that is the case? And secondly, um, from your perspective as a lecturer in that uh, in that lecture room or the professor, uh, what is your perspective on uh, students ha having that behavior? Yeah, it always frustrates me intensely that uh, students are too frightened to put up their hand or ask a question. And interestingly, delivering lectures online um, seem to lower the barrier slightly for questions to be asked. So there's the chat function. And in some of my lectures, I would actually have a PhD student uh, as uh, beside somewhere else in, in the virtual space who would monitor the chat while I was giving the lecture and interrupt me with a question. So in a sense, sometimes the question could be um, anonymized. It didn't come from person X. I think some people I think it's cultural they, they, where you respect the, the lecturer or something and you shouldn't question them or ask, ask them. Uh, some people are shy. Some people are terribly frightened of making a fool of themselves. But as I always try and encourage students, you know, no question is a silly question. Uh, if, you, if you don't understand something, um, but you don't ask the question, well, you know, you'll just sail on not knowing. Whereas if you stop and ask the question, lots of your cohort are going to be really grateful because... Um, they had either the same issue they hadn't understood or it's giving them time to process and catch up and think about stuff uh, or consider your question and um, the, the response. So um, I always am really thankful for any student who interrupts and, and asks a question because I think um, that encourages others to do the same. And uh, Lecturers are not not gods. They 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 often make mistakes. They may say the wrong thing, or they may not understand something, or they may not have conveyed information particularly well. And having a student ask the question is always, um, in my experience, beneficial. So why how how do we? I think the teaching formats can can facilitate uh, the way the information is conveyed. So one of our units, um, a third year unit. We broke into little discussion groups uh, where a research paper was um, given to the group. Uh, one person had to read the paper and present it to the group as if you know, they'd done the work or explain what was happening in the paper. And then the students would, would discuss the paper and ask, ask questions about the paper. And then it would be moderated by a tutor or a lecturer. Um, and it always amazed me how a student's perspective of a paper can be completely different to what I'd anticipated when I would give the set the paper. Uh, and students would worry intensely about certain details that I would have just totally dismissed or not even noticed. <clears throat> and of course, that perspective develops, I guess, through your career. But um, I found that, and the students also really enjoyed coming to grips with um, discovering how paper's written, where the information is, is it all true? Um, what should I be looking for? Um, which bits do I need to pay attention to and, and so on. And that empowers students. There was a lot more participation in those cases. Right. Sort of uh, approaching the end of our questions, we have two, two more questions. And um, you, do you, I guess, sort of have answered this question for, for scientists, for young scientists, but what advice would you have for young people in life? 
Maybe not, not necessarily a scientist. I I think um, one of the things is is being optimistic. Uh, I know it's there are so many difficulties with society at the moment, and and I think one of the beauties of, of, of being young is is querying things, challenging things, being really passionate about stuff, and that's a time when your views you know you can be really dogmatic about something, and of course later in life you might change. Um, but that's fine. I think being able to protest and interact and discuss uh, ideas, social change, social social inequity. How do we how do we build a society that's that benefits everyone um, and is sustainable? <clears throat> right. Oh, and the, the last thing that we like to ask everyone uh, is: we want to collect a sort of quote book. So, so like words of wisdom uh so like do you have like a sentence or two that you could add to that again it can be about science or it can be about life in general anything really yes so this is better when you have have some notice to think about it <laughs> yeah. uh, i remember i was doing an interview um for the COVID during the lockdown and i passed on that question but i think it was who's your favorite scientist um so oh. what what should you value i think <clears throat> I think um, I think COVID has certainly um, made bring brought this to the fore. I think your your health and well being really relies on on your friendships uh, and family. So being very mindful about um, maintaining and developing a network, a social network, um, which can take you you know through life um, and whatever job or um, study your undertaking um, and I think these days people are much are expected to be much more flexible about their careers so uh, knowing that you probably are going to have to chop and change but I think um, developing a social network and, and maintaining that it's not something I've done very well I have a very small social network but like um, it's interesting as a scientist going through my career uh, the, the, the friends that you develop along the way uh, can become lifelong colleagues. You don't have to be in contact with them very frequently, but every time you connect with them again, it's really nice to have people all around the world uh, in contact and, and, you know, hear how they're going. Um, or more locally, uh, people who, who you can call on when, when, when you need support or they need support. Um, so that would, sorry, very long-winded answer. That's okay. That's so good. Sure. Well, yeah, that was it. Thank you very much for meeting with us. As a very enjoyed that conversation. Well, thank you, Manny, and thank you, Carlo, um, and I wish you well in the, in your rest of your interviews, and I also wish you well in your undergraduate studies.